Welcome back. It's been a two-week hiatus. We ran into some scheduling issues last week, but very, very happy to bring the pod back to our listeners. My name's David Mundy. This is the old bull young buck, and with me is my work colleague, young Griffin Logue. How colleague, are you, mate? Colleague. It improves every week, mate. <laughs> mate to a colleague, acquaintance. What next? But nah, good to be here, mate. Good to see you again. You um, too. You too. Here we are. Last yeah. week. Yeah, we did have a week off. It's been a long time since uh, Lockie Schultz was on the, the plumber, the tradie. And wasn't he great? He was good. A lot of sayings, a lot of... Oh, he does claim to be the funny guy, and he probably is the funny guy, isn't he, at the end of the day? So, good on him, anyway. Um, yeah, what do you think of the game on the weekend, mate? Yeah, well, we... clearly our game on the weekend was horrible, wasn't it? It was yeah. um, not a great uh, production in front of our home fans in particular, but um, certainly a lot to take out of it, a lot to learn and a lot to improve on. And um, hopefully our next few games towards the back end of the, our year um, are a big improvement. Mm. How'd you go in? Uh, we've just got out of home quarantine. How'd you yes. go getting out of that? Yep. First day out was yesterday. So um, went down the ocean still. It was a shocking day for it, but <laughs> uh, still nice to have a look and jump in the water, nice and cold at least, but um, get out and just kind of live, mate, experience a bit of life a bit. So yourself? Oh, it's amazing how different it is when you have the choice, isn't it? Mm. You didn't necessarily do anything special or go to no. any great lengths to enjoy the day, but um, just being able to have that choice and yeah, duck out. But walking between downpours was really nice. Yeah, exactly. Anyway, enough about quarantine. It's two weeks of boring time we don't need to talk about. Gives me um, great, great pleasure and it's a great honour to, to uh, welcome on one of the all-time greats, if not the greatest of greats of the club. Uh, I'll be happy to say it. I'm sitting in royalty right now. So with Dave Mundy and any... Without further ado, Pav, welcome, mate. Good on you. Thanks Hello, for coming in. Thanks for having us. Nice to be here, boys. How you going? How, how's it feel? Well, it's ha- nice ha- to be to here. Be it's, it's nice to finally be invited. I've been actually waiting for a long time, this invitation to, to come. Jump um, in mind, And, mate. you know, really it's come on the back of uh, someone about to break my record. So I'm a bit flat. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a bit flat. That's yeah, what it's taken. We've got plenty of others. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> bit, bit of a backhand, isn't it? Just come on. But by the way, I'm... It's, this week I'm breaking. Yeah. breaking oh, I'm going to be better so. than you. Yeah, that's that's, yeah. that's basically the point. <laughs> it's, pretty, it's, 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 it's what he's done. So, have you had a listen to any? Uh, free, we'll put you on the spot. Not one. Not, not one. one. No. Jeez. No. The, <laughs> you'll listen to this one. Make sure we listen to this one. Yeah. Replaying it back all the time. Yeah. Yeah. No, no, I have. I've been tuning in. It's been uh, a very successful partnership. Congratulations to the two of you and to the club yeah. to bring this all together. Um, nice initiative, and it's good to get sort of some of the backstories. Not only the current players, but. Lots of the old guys that have, have come back through. Um, you know, it's always a good way to, to get some more interesting stories and flesh out some of the detail as compared to just being bike grabs that normally exist um, in day-to-day media life, which uh, I'm a part of these days. But mm. uh, it, it's good to, as I said, flesh out some of those old stories. There's been so, – those um, past players have been some of my particular favourites. Yeah. There's Headland in particular and, and Josh Carr, some of those stories. So, yeah, it's nice to be able to bring those to our followers. Yeah, we touched on it before, but Desi's ability is to kind of rattle off. You give him one it's kind incredible. of anything yeah. and he'd have a whole backstory, a whole kind of different <laughs> swing on anything. It was just great to kind of listen to it, especially. I didn't have much to do with the club back when he was drafted. I was only just born, so it was good. Just Thanks to, for reminding us, mate. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we're on, old. I've got to have sound enough on, on this table. I've got to have sound. I've got, got youth. It's about it here, so... Um, what a day anyway, um, aside from having a great man on, uh, we did see some big news this morning. One of Fremantle's, uh, yeah, greatest sons, uh, Stephen Hill, hanging up the boots. What are your thoughts on that? That's a sad day. It really yeah. is. Um, I mean, I loved playing with Stephen Hill and I think that's one thing that all of his teammates would have said they loved playing with Hilly. Uh, and so it's a sad day, I think for all current and former players uh, mm. who played alongside the number 32, not to see him running around ever again. Um, you know, I remember first meeting Stephen and he walked in the club, probably 68 kilos, um, this sort of flock of, you know, almost curly long uh, hair. Yeah. Um, but he just ran like the wind. Like it was just this incredible and just used the ball really well. And you just knew it immediately that the club had found a player that they, they needed and that we required at that point in time. Um, and, you know, played 23 games in his first year. Um, remember the Derby in, in 20, uh, 2009, uh, his debut um, Derby sort of about three or four bounces, a big, long raking goal from outside 50. And we knew we'd found a player offensively, but what I think, isn't well known, um, but should be well known is what a great um, defensive player he was and what a great coverer um, of backsides that he was for for his teammates. Anytime that you were caught out 
and you said Hilly, he would just immediately react and, and cover cover your own uh, man or, or you know, get in the way, intercept. He was just such a great team player, um, became a real professional and someone I, I admire a lot for the way he went about it. Mm. Absolutely. And he probably had one of his biggest challenges in his career this morning. He's stood up in front of the group and, and spoke to he us. Is a, which he's, is a, he's, a shy, he's a shy man and doesn't like speaking at the best of times. Well, I saw him on the time. way and I, I think he shared as many words then as he did day one when I first, <laughs> when I first met him. He hasn't changed in that yeah. way. And that's where he's different from his brother. I think his brother could uh, talk all day long, talk, talk underwater, underwater yeah. but, uh, yeah, yeah. but Steve Absolutely. doesn't have much to say. But another thing that you admire about him greatly because he could have so much impact in a group um, by not having too much to say. Yeah. He, he delivered a lot by his actions. Um, you know, clearly you want people who have a bit of both, but um, yeah, I think everyone loved playing with Hilly for those reasons. Absolutely. And one of the ones in Hilly's career that always comes up is the Geelong goals brought up in his press conference mm. he's just had. Um, where were you when that happened? <laughs> I was telling Tommy Sheridan to get out the way. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, everyone seen the footage, Tommy leading into his space. I was actually, um, I was down the line. So, you know, the, the, the kick got, um, went out to Aaron and he swatted it towards the boundary line and I was maybe 40 meters down the line. So I could, it was one of those things where in slow-mo, you can see this thing happening because Lockie Neal comes off, um, as the ball's been kicked, Steve's about to come on. And I legitimately remember seeing, so Aaron go up and angling. I was like, oh, this is going to come off. <laughs> and on. so I just started backpedaling, trying to get um, Tom Lonergan out the way, um, as compared to Tommy. <laughs> trying to get him dragging him in, <laughs> bringing them all into the space. <laughs> um, and then by the time, I think Hilly had, had uh, so much pace up, by the time he got to me, he'd actually got in front of me. <laughs> I was on the 50 and Hilly plotting. was inside 50. I was plotting. Um, <laughs> And then as soon as the goal was kicked, I remember everyone sort of jumping on. And it's one thing, not that um, I just immediately went to, okay, six wing, get someone behind the ball, all the things that rather than actually celebrating the moment in the, in the replay, I'm sitting there going, someone get behind yeah, the really. ball. But uh, it was, um, yeah, an epic moment. And, uh, and yeah, that's, I think still to this day, the best win the club's ever had. A final down in Geelong. Um, Healy kicks the winning goal and, uh, and we go on to have a home premium against uh, Sydney in, in two weeks' time. Yeah. yeah, so he's been a fantastic player, to, as you mentioned, to play with, and um, we wish him all the, all the best. We wish we could have had him for longer and for more games, particularly in this back end of his career. But um, yeah, certainly it's been a pleasure to play with Stephen. Yeah, what you blokes would have had ten years with him. It was a, would have been. Yeah, it's a long time, isn't it? I, the together. funny thing with Hilly, I remember in my last year, so twenty sixteen, we were sitting on the physio beds together, getting some treatment, um, and he said, "Oh, how old are you?" And I said, "Oh, yeah, I'm 30 or whatever it was. I said, how old are you, Hilly? He goes, oh, I'm 20, 26 or 27 or what he was at that time. And I said, oh, that's the same age I was when you arrived at the club. And it just for me, I sort of blew his mind. That, <laughs> oh, shit, I'm as old as Pav. <laughs> Which, uh, you know, great player and, uh, and someone we admire. Yeah, definitely. Funny, funny bloke. He's a funny man and good on him anyway. If he's listening, probably won't be listening, but thanks, He'll Steve. He'll be tuning in. <laughs> you'd hope so, yeah. You'd, you'd hope so. Um, aside from this, that big news, it's also a big week all around. Uh, we did say we're bringing you in as a bit of a backhand with uh, Monday 353, <laughs> but uh, it's one of the biggest items. So we'll be equaling Matthew Pavlich's record of 350 AF, 353 AFL games. So still trying to get my head around that. It's a lot of, lot of, lot of football between you two. Um, How's it going to work? Do you, do you get chaired off for a for an equaling of the record? Is that no, how? It, no, no, it's no, not no, how it works. I wouldn't have thought so. No, no. he has to get <laughs> past it. Do you have to? Do you get? Do you get get past it and then get chaired off? Is another chair off that you're just yeah, trying yeah, to? Well, I've got a. I mean, I've said question. it already. And yeah. If I get a chair off the weekend after that, do I get a chair off for every week after that <laughs> next year? I think you yes. might. I reckon yeah. <laughs> you might have to. It's in his contract for next <laughs> yeah. year. I but get chaired off every week. <laughs> yeah, I break the new record. It has to be so. Um, how does, is, is there a little bit of kind of, no, no sadness. Um, I, I think it's great that someone's, you know, played long enough and, and, um, had the durability, um, the mental application and the physical skill to go on and play what will be 19 years of, of AFL football, um, when you go around next year. So, um, and having played with David for a long time and worked closely with him in the leadership group capacity, um, yeah, the older, there's no one better to take it over. But I, I truly kind of believe that the fact that we had a, a long working relationship with each other, uh, admired the way he went about it, how he evolved, how he, how he changed his game. Um, and you know, I think it's a significant 
uh, moment for the club to, to realize that we've got someone else who's going to take the baton on and, uh, and continue on into a 19th AFL season. It's quite remarkable. Long time, 19 seasons. Mm. Barra, you've done, done well. It'll be a long time before anyone gets anywhere close to 350 again, won't it? It'd have to be well, I thought that many games. Steve Hill, I thought he was on yeah. track. He'd hardly missed a game um, up until sort of about game 150, 200 ish. I can't remember yeah. exactly. But Belly mentioned this morning he got to 109, about 109 100, in his first yeah. nine years. Yeah, That's which incredible. is unbelievable. Yeah, right. uh, and unfortunately, I've got this theory though about guys who play a long time. Sean, Sean Burgoyne went past 400 earlier this year. Uh, you know, myself, a few others. David, I think, rings true is the fact that they don't have any real physical aspects that are any good. <laughs> like, <laughs> Cheers. Well, there we go. That's what we're talking he's about. Not, he's not that quick. He's no. undersized as well. He, he's a terrible runner. Like yeah. he's never three Ks and two Ks. Horrendous. Yeah. Not that strong in the gym. Does okay, but nothing he's too. Got, he's got old man strength now, but that's about old it. Old man strength. That's about it. Yeah. Grip mm. strength. I'm out wrestled Griff. You know, Have you really? Yeah. He's oh, filthy. Come on, mate. So. I'll, I'll give you time to science. You're weak, mate, but you don't, you don't want to go down this road. So. <laughs> How can you lose to the old guy? Oh, mate, I'll go anyway, more about him. him. Got to give him wins. The, yeah. fa the fact is, um, I reckon that the less physical speed you have or strength you have or ballistic movement you have, the more likely you are to be more durable. Now, mm. you've got to have lots of footy IQ and uh, a bit of luck along the way with injuries and, and great mental application to keep getting up week after week for a long period of time. But um, like I played with Shawnee Burgoyne for a long time growing up and um, he was so good gifted with skill and knew where the ball was about to go, but he, he wasn't that fast and he wasn't that uh, silky, good of a runner, but he was silky. very silky with the ball in hand, a bit like this guy, used the ball so well. So maybe there's a theory out there for recruiters. Doesn't, Don't worry about the physical capability, just worry about a bit of footy I, IQ and they're okay at you know, most things. It doesn't really add up, mate, because you're a bit of a specimen if I do not say so. So, I mean, you're six foot four, full of muscle. Like, <laughs> that doesn't really make sense. Land if, down if, under. If you're going, I don't know, good, good song, great song. 353 <laughs> games from you at 100 kilos. I mean, you weren't moving like, you probably, sorry, Dave, but he's moving a bit better than you throughout his career. So how'd you, how'd you manage it then? Oh, a fair bit of luck. I mentioned that. Um, I, I remember a couple, of, I remember one game in particular. I went up for a mark and it was we were playing the Saints uh, at Subiaco and I came down and, Matty DeBoer being the kamikaze that he is. Head first. So it was head first. And I, I'd sort of landed and he and his opponent came in and they must have got pushed or something. But my foot was like you know, a millimetre off the ground. If it was planted right, on the ground yeah. or broken leg, yeah. knee gone. And I remember, so we sort of both got swept off our feet. We did a tumble and I somehow took the mark. And I remember thinking, oh, wow, that could have been season over or like career over. So, yeah. And how many times does the opposite happen? So much, yeah. Anthony Morabito, yeah, yeah. Luke Webster, guys that we played with, with four knee reconstructions and just horrible luck. Uh, Hilly's probably mm. another good example of, of just rotten luck when it comes to soft tissue. So yeah. a bit of luck goes a long way. Uh, lots of, lots of application, like both mentally and physically. Uh, you know, Jeff Boyle and Ivo Capilana and Ken Withers are three guys Ivo. who uh, <laughs> I spent a lot of time with uh, getting my body right. They're the real um, big three, aren't they? <laughs> the big three. Yeah. The big three. Don't worry about Roger, Ruffer yeah. or Novak. It's, <laughs> it's, it's Ivo, Kenny and Boyley. <laughs> you are your Ivo. What's your power? But yeah, so um, it's spending a lot of time on your body, extra recovery, yoga. Like I... I wasn't good at stretching or um, I didn't really like going to yoga, but I did it because I knew that it would help me perform. Plus give me the, the mental space to kind of just tune out. So all the little one percenters, it's cliche as it is, um, they all add up in the end. And we've spoken a little bit about the similarities or the crossover here, but he come in a bit like you, come in as a man child. He hasn't changed in 20 years. Except for the grey hair. Yeah. <laughs> raw, raw, raw power, mate. Raw, raw power is a way to put it, yeah. So he came in and started dominating people from 18 years old. So that, I think that helps. Uh, yeah, maybe. But so I've got this, um, the Outliers book by Malcolm Gladwell, right? So, you know, young kids that are a bit older in their years at school are, are most likely to succeed at school sport and then go on. But I was, because I'm December 31st, New Year's Eve baby, I was actually uh, the opposite when it came to not schooling years, but playing years. So I would play in that year. And so, I would, yes, I was, you know, big enough when I was younger, but... Um, I'd always try to play against the older kids to, you know, try my hardest, not, you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't dominate as much. You learn different lessons. And so being a bigger body helps. I think all three of us, um, have that in common in some ways, albeit, um, you know, it sort of took you a little while to, to become a big body midfielder. Um, 
But I think that yeah, I'm not entirely sure that outliers thing rings true for AFL players, uh, or certainly not in my example. Mm. And uh, so you'll pick four from SA. Frio's second pick that year. Does that burn yeah. a bit? Yeah, it does. Yeah. <laughs> Paul Hazelby got me. <laughs> got me by two. Uh, you're going to get me by whatever <laughs> it is. No, um, Hayes was a jet. So he won the Lark medal at the, the under 18 yeah. carnival. He, he dominated, um, that particular, that series. I actually had a, a pretty average carnival from memory. Um, but yeah, still got drafted over here. Uh, Lee Brown was the other one. Mm. Big Brownie, uh, took, uh, was taken at, at pick number five. So, um, a bit like the draft a couple of years ago with, with Andy and, and Chez and a few others, um, the club loaded up with young talent, uh, way back in 1999, believe it or not. How, how long ago it was. How long ago? Jeez. How old were you, Griff? One. Mate. <laughs> one. <laughs> one. One. So you were in your nappies. And I was getting drafted. Still, I would have had good muscle tone back then. Nice big hairy back as well. I reckon to go with it. So, the forearms. Still got, yeah, yeah forearms. They're still going, mate. So, well, you were getting, you're getting your, your butt wiped, and I was passing out of training. It was a great, it was a great <laughs> tell us about that story. Glad you brought that up. Out. Yeah. Well, uh, yeah. So, um, drafted in, I guess it was November of that year. I can't remember exactly. That's how long ago it was. Um, and Hayes, uh, so he was drafted on, on the Saturday and was, you know, at training on the, on the Monday. It took, some of the interstate guys a little longer to, to come across. It's a bit different to, to how it's structured now, but in that space between I was drafted and uh, coming over to Perth, I snuck in a little trip to schoolies with with my mates um, <laughs> down in Victor Harbour with the guys I went to school with. And so it wasn't the most elite preparation um, for, a, for a day one of pre-season. Got, got to do it though, don't you? Got to sneak those opportunities got to do in. It, yeah. Absolutely. Um, so I came across on a Sunday night. Hayes actually picked me up from the, the host family that I was living with. And we went around um, to Aquinas College where we were training back in the day. And it was one of those sort of December mornings in Perth that it gets to, I don't know, 35 degrees by about 9.30 a.m. And then the sea breeze comes in, it sort of cools it all down. But it was a hot, sort of humid mm-hmm. morning. And I, I mean, I can't remember if you think back to your very first training session, but what your mindset was and like, even for anyone listening, what was the mindset of your first day on your first job? Got to go. Go, go. Yeah, you got to go. go. You got to yeah. You got to go hard. And so, you know, I was there wanting to impress, wanting to show no chink in the armor. And we did about 90 minutes of ball work uh, in pretty hot conditions and then uh, finished that. And I was, I was pretty cooked. I was toasted. Um, but the running coach, Jimmy Bridle, came over and said, all right, boys, we've got six one Ks. And so sort of off to the start line we went. And I was running with a bunch of key position guys. And I got around the first four pretty well. Um, the fifth one, uh, I started to, to really struggle, was sort of hanging on the back of this group. But I just kept thinking, get across the line, you'll be fine. Got across the finishing line, started seeing stars and like really sort of stumbling around and had a massive spew <laughs> um, not too far from where the finish line was and sort of cut, took a couple of paces away just for, to compose myself. And the running coach came over and said, oh, we've got one more. Do you think you can do it? And I, as I wiped the spew away from my mouth, <laughs> I was like, yeah, no, of course, course, I'm fine. Course, I'm fine. I'm yeah, fine. Yeah, yeah. Where do I, where do I start? So away we went up to the start line and I immediately dropped off the back of the running group and I knew I was in for a tough two laps, but I just kept thinking one foot in front of the other, just get through it. It's only two laps. I got about two thirds of the way around my first lap and I had this overwhelming feeling as if I was running closer and closer to the ground. <laughs> Hayes, who loves telling this story, he says yeah. I was, it was like I was going down an escalator. <laughs> <laughs> Passed out, I collapsed. And the next thing I remember was waking up in uh, Murdoch Hospital with, you know, monitoring devices and drips and whatever else. Chucked you on the drip. Jeez. With, with like the worst headache you could ever imagine. It was <laughs> like I had the worst hangover of all time. Um, and a couple of players were coming in later that night, properly meeting me as I was in intensive care. So strange old way to uh, start an AFL career. It's a, it's a pretty scary moment. I've had the same story from Jeff Boyle's perspective and the, and the medical team at the time and this big 100 kilo teenager just falling over <laughs> on the side of the oval. Was, uh, I wasn't 100 kilo. Alarm, alarm, was alarm bells. <laughs> yeah. They, well, and this was the thing. Like I, I was so embarrassed. I was so embarrassed after um, that happened. You know, I think I had a couple of days off and then slowly came back, integrating back into the program where there was a little bit of weight, so jumping on the bike. And then it actually took me a little while to, to regather myself. And I, um, I had this view inside my own head that the guys were, you know, laughing at me. I look, what we've drafted, all this kind of stuff. 
not thinking of all the upside that may be pushing yep. yourself to the absolute max mm. and showing that you were here and you weren't going to give up and you were going to stick through it uh, and all the respect that they came from that. I didn't see that at the time. Yeah. In hindsight, you see it and you hear other guys speak about, oh, geez, we, we've got a good one here. But yep. at the time you're like, oh, this yep. is awkward. Yeah. <laughs> So from those beginnings, then 353 games, 700 goals later. It's not a bad uh, resume you've constructed. Yeah, and and went through lots of different places on the ground. And I, I think this is the other thing for someone who who plays a long period of time is um, creating variety in your own game so that it's hard for you to be dropped is is not a bad thing. Yeah. Um, but also uh, creating variety in your game so when you're um, playing in different positions, you get an appreciation of what it is like playing key back mm. when you go back playing as a key forward or when as a midfielder, you've got some empathy for mm. the backline players, because yeah. if it waltzes out of the middle and someone can lace out the forward, you know, you understand what it means for Griff when you're playing the back. So that overall perspective of what it means, every working piece of the puzzle on the field is actually absolutely critical. And if, if one little chink or one little aspect of that puzzle isn't in place, then it can really tear it apart. And I think that certainly helped my longevity and it also helped me, um, play at a, at a high level for a, a period of time. Is that high understanding of the game something that you always kind of knew that you had kind of growing up when you're getting drafted? I mean, obviously, yeah. the ability to be, be an All-Australian at all three positions is not talked about enough, to be honest. Mm. But, I mean, you honestly must have to understand the game so well to be able to do that. Is that something that you've always known? Yeah, I mean, I, so Dad um, was a SNFL player. He, he coached in SA. So he, he taught me the game. Uh, and he taught me from all different aspects, really. Um, I, he tells a story, my first ever game in year two, it was, I think, you know, I'm not sure what it was. There was no Oz kick back then. It was, you had to sort of wait. I think I played a couple of years of soccer and basketball, and then I finally got a, a gig to play uh, in, in, in footy. <clears throat> and, um, and he talks about um, quarter time of this first game that I ever played. I'd like come in, I was like sweating profusely. I was like red faced and I was like out of breath. And he said, oh, Maybe don't try to get to every single contest. Just try to get to, <laughs> if you can't get to the first one, maybe get to where you think the ball might be going. And he, he kind of talks about it as this sort of blase off the cuff sort of comment. But somehow, you know, um, through his teachings or, or an eight or whatever it may have been, he said, I, I, I started to pick up, you know, if you can't get to A, you can kind of get to B, yep. which is what, what we heard yeah. uh, later on in our careers. But um, so look, I think his, those foundations of, of football and what it meant were, were through him. Um, but like you just constantly keep evolving and, and learning. I think David now into year 18, new coach, new system, the game changed. You've you got to mm. keep adapting. You've got to keep evolving at every single turn. And you know, the moment you sit still or think you've got it covered in the AFL, the moment it'll flip you on your backside and, and tell you how hard it is. Um, you've got to keep on your game the whole time. That's how challenging the, the environment is. Yeah, right. Griff mentioned it just before, but let's just go back and harp on it. You're an All-Australian in each zone, back, mid, forward, bench, and you're 34 odd All-Australians that you won. <laughs> um, incredible achievement. How, in that first year when you were playing back, playing obviously quite well, establishing, establishing yourself, how quickly did you think, I don't want to be a backman anymore? Yeah, very quickly. <laughs> yeah. Well, and these were the, so I was telling this story um, the other day to Brennan Cox, actually. I saw him at the game briefly. And, you know, talking about uh, what it's like to be a forward versus what it's like to be a defender and you get appreciation for both. So that year I played in the likes of Matthew Lloyd, Matthew Richardson, David Neitz, Warren Treadray, uh, Alistair Lynch, you know, sort of so superstar after superstar. And it was in the days there was no off-ball support, yeah. there was no plus one, there was no assertive yeah. <laughs> defending back, or help back, defense. Back shoulder. It was literally back shoulder, sitting or standing in the goal square. I remember this, we were playing Essendon at Etihad Stadium or whatever it was back then, the Telstra Dome perhaps. Friday night game, 50,000 bomb supporters. Essendon lose one game that year going to win the premiership. Playing on Matthew Lloyd in like the peak of his career, yeah. <laughs> and no one else, no one else inside fifty. <laughs> it was so nerve wracking. Yeah. It was one of the most scary, lonely feelings you could ever have. But again, you learn um, what it's like, how you make your opposition play vulnerable, uh, and vice versa. Um, when you go back forward, if someone starts playing assertive on you or pushes you or puts you in a different position, you're like, oh, I've got to change that. So, you, yeah. Uh, and I would, I'd advocate that for any player, if you can. Um, 
playing different positions, even at training, you know, just try something different to, to keep learning about the game. Uh, it's, it's really important. And, but yeah, I mean, I was fortunate to have a, a reasonable year that year. And then I was sort of starting to transition into more of a sort of half forward mid uh, for a couple of years after that before playing you know, mainly as a, as a forward thereafter. Yeah. Big pressure forward. <laughs> Never a pressure board. That's, that's a yeah. big pressure board. Imagine, imagine that coming off the line. Be good. The problem yeah. is it would be one effort and then I'll be done. <laughs> Gassed out. But you mentioned obviously you did, uh, there was a lot of learning in that process on the way to, and you clearly did learn 700 goals, a couple of big hauls, eight goals, nine, nine goal hauls. Is that the highest? Nine goals? Is that? Do you remember? Yeah. Are there any big performances that kind of stand out and go, yeah, I, I reckon I was pretty good there. I had, I had a couple. I had a couple. I had a couple. Um, uh, there was some periods, um, sort of mid to late 2000s, where I was generally playing as a forward, but would sometime sort of come into the mid, uh, yeah, sort of maybe an 80-20 split where I was able to find the ball a bit and, and then, you know, get on the end of a few goals as well. So um, I remember one game at, at Footy Park in 20, uh, 2005, um, we had lots of players out. I'm not sure if you remember playing this game. Might have even been um, your rising star. Yep. The, the pop yeah. Yeah. Um, and we had Belly and the cars and Cookie and all these, you know, sort of experienced guys out. We went across there and we ended up going down only by a kick, but I, I, I ended up kicking eight and we, we, it, that helped us build towards the back end of that year and into 2006. And it was that young group together, um, like David and a number of those guys who, um, yeah, you, you, so, you know, you, you play well individually, but you, you remember the, some of those things and what sticks in your mind about, I remember when David went back with a flight and did this, or you remember when so-and-so stood up in that big moment. As a young group, you have those games. Uh, and if you play well in those games, you probably remember them, remember them more fondly than others. Mm. Uh, just quickly on that game, I remember um, Freya put together a whole life package of that game because, yeah, it was my Rising Star nomination. But from that game, I can remember having the ball running out of halfback on the interchange side. And uh, Rhett Biglins was after me. He was a big man, <laughs> chasing me down. And Troy Cook from nowhere just come past and shepherded him. him yeah. And all I can remember was just the yeah. slap. And it had so much, so much space. And uh, Cookie was a great teammate. Cookie it's, it's was good, pure <laughs> slap, isn't it? Yeah. Nice, nice old shepherd. Oh, he was one of the hardest players oh, yeah. ever played with. He was seriously hard. Cookie loved playing with him. Yeah. So we touched on cha the changing game, and we did mention that Dave was drafted as a as a fullback. Myself included, drafted as a fullback. You had a few big nine goal hauls. If you had to choose now to come into the game, you're one out in the square like you were with Lloydo, and you go, I want, I'm want, i going to try to kick 12. Yep. Who are you going to kick 12 on, myself or Dave? Dave. <laughs> Great answer. <laughs> Great answer. He's finally answer. got one. Well done, mate. It's one, one for the good guys. But um, <laughs> when, you, when you were playing, when you were playing um, is there anything that kind of got into your head that really, like, really ticked you off? Was it someone who was yapping? Was someone who would felt the back of your elbows is it something that work you under kind of what what gets in your what would get in your head if if they did um probably umpires am i allowed to say that <laughs> well, right. we won't but you can <laughs> yeah. we, we can nod in the back yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. um yeah uh, and opposition crowds like every now and then i used to love playing the away derbies i used mm. to love um running out with you know subiaco fully packed with west coast supporters and and you know and going on and, and being a dominant force and winning those games that, that that was always nice um but yeah the umpires are ones that always I, I and i knew at the time that i shouldn't be having a go at them, but i knew at the time you're going to stay in the moment and, and and not be distracted by a bad decision but yeah that, oh, there was i mean yeah no one really ever said anything or did anything that really upset me i mean yeah it was uh, you build up a pretty thick skin uh, and but when i first started it was pretty brutal like you know the the punch on with Guardy in the, in the square back in my first year. That's, I got knocked that's out. Great. That's great. Isn't that? <laughs> that's great. There wasn't much punching. I was just getting punched. Um, and then, you know, that later that game, uh, Ashley McIntosh and Jacko claimed me out. I was knocked out. So, you know, I played in some brutal early mm. um, sort of years of, of what it was like. And it changed a lot. Players, players these days are much harder than when I played. It's just a different hardness or a different... Like hardly anyone ever takes a short step. Hardly anyone doesn't go back with a flight. You see it every now and then, but much uh, less regularly than you did, um, you know, 20 or 30 years ago. But it's mm. different because, um, <clears throat> you yeah, know, you could literally punch someone and you wouldn't know mm. um, back then. Yeah, with no cameras around. Yeah. yeah. 
Yeah, you would have come through that progression of, I remember when we got the first down the ground camera at training yeah. and I remember the look on everyone's face was like, oh no, <laughs> can't hide anymore. Yeah. Move, move. It was, well, screen. it was about 2005 where yeah. the behind the goals footage for the, um, for the game started. And I remember as a forward, you know, emptying out, what do you have to empty out for? Like, well, they'll be right, the defenders, they'll be fine. <laughs> and then all of a sudden you realise, I. Oh, get the kicking board so it was about this you know as soon as the ball's turned over you have to empty out empty and get out. to the other end um yeah but that the behind the girls footage was the and people talk about um laws of the game committee and the afl changing rules and it yeah they do but it's on the basis of coaches having all this footage and all this time to train their team to be elite at their craft and therefore the game is so much different than it once was because mm. it's become full-time professional and there's all these different cam camera angles that never existed before. It's not the yeah. fact that the AFL are just changing rules. Yeah. That, yeah, is it, uh, what's the catalyst? It's the fact that you know, coaches and players are, are better at their craft. And uh, another one that really um, springs up when talking to some guys of the era in your time at the Freo Footy Club was uh, the pristine story. <laughs> Do you want to run us through, run us through that one? Yeah, so... Uh, yeah, this is a beauty. I think everyone, <laughs> everyone dines out on this one, including Ross himself. Uh, he, he uses this at every corporate gig he yeah, speaks at these days. A bit more mayo every time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So we were, uh, it was 2012, um, Ross's first year at the club. I think it was uh, round six. So I think we were four and two. We'd started the season pretty well under under Ross. Uh, and we headed up to the Gold Coast, um, you know, new team early in the season. I think it was one of those trips where you, you guys probably – um, given the, the last two years, you, you don't care how hard it is given your travel and your quarantine. But we uh, fly to Brisbane, drive down to the Gold Coast, sort of stay there. And that sort of, it's a bit of a, bit of an epic trip. Mm. Anyway, we, we um, play in the Gold Coast. Uh, we're sort of in the game, but not not going that well at half time. And Ross comes down just breathing fire. Um, and he sort of like says a few things and everyone sort of breaks off. And, um, and you know, you, you know, it's coming this, this sort of, half time yeah. um crack at some point but i it was one of those gold coast um days was hot and slippery and humid so i came in took my kid off <clears throat> you know got re-strapped the whole thing um wanted to dry off because i was just dripping with sweat and as a forward like you know any any type of slippage you get to drop the mark or whatever so do all that everyone has their little line meetings we go into ross and ross was saying was, you know if the team wasn't performing you always started at the top and so he looked at me, he's like, where's our captain? And like, you know, sort of looking around for me, I was sitting right in front of him. <laughs> Here, Ross. <laughs> he said, have a look at you. You look pristine, not a bead of sweat on you. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, he just kept going and going. And I couldn't say, oh, well, you know, man, I've just man, I had just a towel down, jumper. I had a quick shower, I just changed the jumper. Relax, just had to cop it. And anyway, we go out, um, win the game, uh, you know, sort of feature, I think, late in the game with a goal and, you know, feel, but we walk in. And everyone was so flat. Uh, it was Spurry's first game. Uh, he hops in the middle. There was no Powerade shower. Everyone sort of sung the uh, the song with without any real gusto. Or um, and then and then so after the game, Bondi I think had caught um, Ross and said, "I, oh, geez, you better just check in with the skip. He might be a bit flat <laughs> after the half." So I was like, oh, "Okay." So anyway, we jump on the bus together from the Gold Coast back to Brisbane. And I'm sort of not feeling great about myself. You know, we won, but you know when you anyway didn't feel great. And then he literally just sat down. He didn't. He didn't say, "Oh, what about the thing at halftime? Yeah, sorry." Or he just. He just told me the whole story about how he exited St Kilda and came to Fremantle. <laughs> <laughs> so for the next seventy minutes, <laughs> I had Ross just chill me here. I hardly said a thing. Yeah. But that was his way of apologising. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was a good story. It was great. Story. Great, great to be there. And another one that's also come up is. Um, well, I've got a story about Ross with you and a beanie. Can you remember the beanie one? From yeah, Gus? another one's come up already. Oh. Yeah. That one's come up, okay. Yeah, yeah. now we um, this is about you, Pav. This is Ooh. your. I thought this was about guest. you. No, <laughs> this is yours, your our guest. Let's mate. make it about Griff. <laughs> <laughs> Another one that came up, um, reaching out to some past players, is your um, connection to South Australia. You're obviously more of a WA person now. You spent more time here, yeah. married to a local girl, great young family. Um, but your love for the SA never went away, and the the young guys coming across in particular received that. Yep, uh, home invites for cook dinners and. Um, sleepovers when re when required. <laughs> um, Griff was a bit put out. Yeah, I was gonna I was just mentioning how much of a privilege it is that you've sat down with us for 
now that we are WA blokes. Any love for the WA boys, mate? <laughs> South Australia, you just, you just love them so much. I mean, you, you wouldn't have wanted to listen to the last couple well, of podcasts, me bloody paying out South Australia. <laughs> so I'm glad you haven't listened to them. <laughs> I stayed here for 21 years. Isn't that enough love for yeah, WA yeah, it's, people? No, nah, look, um, it, um, I love, yeah, that connection you have with someone that you grew up with that's come across from interstate. With and some of the young Victorian blokes as well, it was always good to have them um, around home. But yeah, certainly the, the guys that were drafted from Adelaide, you got that connection. Um, you know that what, what it's like. And, uh, and yeah, nothing against Victorians or WA or anyone else from around the country, but there was a strong connection there. And it goes beyond the playing group. Um, Adam Reed, good friend of yours, yeah. growing up, and um, he's actually shown everyone this video. I think he's come through the four walls. <laughs> but do you want to talk us through the cricketing video? Well, yeah. So Adam and I, um, Adam was best mates uh, at Kindy. So the first day at Kindy, he and this um, one of our very close family friends, David Floriani, they met at Kindy. They're both a year older than I am. And he happened to live around the corner and it basically started this lifelong friendship between Adam and David and, and therefore me by connection. Really? And, and so that we all, yeah, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Oh, yeah. We all, you know, every, every afternoon or every summer, it was like, you know, um, BMX riding, cricket, footy, basketball, golf, tennis, like whatever it was. And it always did with sport, just being outdoors and trying to outdo each other. And being a bit younger than those guys, I was always trying to, you know, beat him at but everything we could, and it included cricket a lot out of uh, Adam Reed's front front yard. Um, and yeah, he used to take the ball up and you know sort of do the whole thing. And this this piece of vision, I don't know why. So he he was always <laughs> he was always fascinated with film. He was studying film at uni years later and whatnot. So he he would always film um, the matches, and whether it was for his own viewing later about what he had to improve upon or whatever, but or. Maybe. Ultra, ultra professional, just reviewing. Yeah. Voyeuristic, perhaps. Yeah. I don't know yeah. what uh, what he was on about professional, but um, yeah, a big in swinger that uh, got me out, and I was wasn't too impressed. Yeah, well, let, to expand, we're on we're not going to show that video. <laughs> you, 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 you glossed over the big in swinger very, very quickly. I've heard it was an absolute peach, and just it's no, it's a good in swinger. I was trying to hit over uh, cow corner or maybe mid on, but. Uh, yeah. It was a ball Jimmy Anderson would be proud of with the Duke swinging it back <laughs> in. It was an incredible ball, but the dummy spit and bat throw was that's equally a, that's, as that's impressive. The stuff. That, 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 make, that makes it all, all the better, just the big dummy spit. So you glossed over that one. It was an important, it was important <laughs> wicket, you know, we were down. <laughs> uh, if you don't react for it, means, it means you don't care you about don't it. Care. That's right. We love it. Thanks, Griff. It's good. Yeah. Uh, and now post footy pad, we see you on the telly every night, doing a great job for Channel 9, enjoying that. Yeah, yeah, not every night. Um, I do it three or four nights a week, but yeah, really enjoyed the transition into some of the media stuff. I, it wasn't a focus for me. I'm, I'm as a player, you do lots of media um, when you're in the game, particularly as, as captain. Um, but I, I genuinely thought by and like you have, and I know you're doing some study, um, sort of the the science degree, then the MBA would maybe sort of take us down uh, a different path to begin with. But um, I think it's been a really good transition out of the game to do some media, some business stuff that I'm involved with um, and get a taste of what I really want to do. And I'm still, believe it or not, I'm almost 40 and I'm still working out what I really want to do because you think about, you know, it was for me growing up, age of two, running around home with a, with a footy in your hands or sport, you wanted to be a professional sportsman. Well, I certainly did. And then I got to live that life for near on 20 years. And so when you start to transition out of the game, um, you know, it's trying to redefine what you really want to do um, when you've always woken up and done what you've always wanted to do for, mm. for a big part of your life. So um, I've enjoyed the transition. The media is good. The Fox stuff, um, you know, on game day, nine's good. Um, but no, it's been a, a, an interesting period. And I think it is for every athlete when they, when they retire. Almost 40 years of doing some things very well. Um, I was going to bring up the Fox footy commentating. You've been the, the sole spectator a few games over the last 18 months. How's that? <laughs> yeah, what's, what's that been like <laughs> sitting in the crowd in your home a few times? It's so time. bizarre. Yeah, yeah, it yeah to be. very. I mean, very weird. What's it like playing? Oh, so strange. Oh, it feels like a training session. Yeah, it's really. just, yeah. it's pretty much just a training session where it's up against bibs. And then you start again. competing a bit more and yeah. Hear, they, they you you hear everything yeah. is, a, is a funny thing where yeah. you, even obviously when you watch a game and there's no crowd, you can hear everything. But if you're out there, it's like, even, you can, even when you're partners on Fox Woody, we can hear, <laughs> <that>. <laughs> we can, we can hear you can hear a lot of things. Yeah. No, look, I think um, it's funny speaking of the Fox stuff. So, um, 
you know, some people will say, oh, you're too biased to frown. Others will say, oh, you're, you're giving the guys a hard time. Like, you know, the role of, of the media is to probably, particularly in that role, is to be as impartial as you can. Um, but, you know, you're, I'm always going to see it in some ways through uh, a bit of a purple and, and white eye. But you do, like, people see through you very quickly if you're not being objective and, and independent and calling it as it is. So um, that's been a journey in itself. But, uh, yeah, the, the question about... Um, uh, what it's like. It's bizarre being there with no one else there. I think that's what everyone's learned around the world and particularly with the Olympics more recently. You need a crowd. Yeah. Like you, you absolutely need a crowd yeah. for it to be great. It's, it's good, but for it to be great, it's pretty, you need a crowd. It's pretty hard to emulate a, a live game without a crowd going on. Oh, there. absolutely. It's, it's very, very different. Seen yeah. it, the, the Olympics, that we'll, well, we'll touch on later, the Olympics, but um, they put on the fake crowd and the fake kind of people pop it on. It's just not, it's just not right. What like, the broadcasters have learned, though, is that you can do things remotely. You can do things differently. You can yeah. make it, for the viewer at home, appear mm. that everyone's at the ground, there's noise, all you know. But for the for the participants, for the players, for, for the commentators, not having a crowd, you, you don't get to feed off that. You don't get all the excitement. The fans make it. Like, it's, yeah. it's a cliche, but they certainly do. Yeah. And your other interest, post football pick stars. Prior to COVID, you and James Begley were jet skating all <laughs> over the world, um, sprouting as virtues, but that's going well. Yeah, it is. Yeah. So um, we started off as a commercial platform for athletes to engage with brands and fans and get um, more deal flow effectively for uh, their time in and out of the game. Um, it's now sort of uh, branched out to more both, both that commercial uh, marketplace. For talent, but also um, we're now sort of providing the technology and the platform for AFL clubs, um, the NRL, Cricket Australia, the NFL, <clears throat> for all their uh, pre-sold commercial and community obligations. So as you know, 21 appearances or whatever it is for an <laughs> AFL player, how do we better um, activate those appearances, but also um, the, rep the return on investment and the data piece for um, whether it be a, a community partner, a commercial partner, or the club, how do how do you justify the spend and the sponsorships moving forward? So yeah, enjoying that that journey. I'm also in, a, in another business PMY with a good mate of mine, Paul Yeoman. So um, yeah, dipping my toe in the water in that way, which I've I've really loved. We'll um, jump into another segment we call Quick Hands. Dave's, Dave's favourite, mate. Quick Hands. Give, give. Since you haven't listened to our pod before, I certainly have. What do you uh, <laughs> I'll just fire these questions out really quickly and want some quick ans answers back. Uh, last time you called your mum. Uh, Sunday. Uh, last meal on earth, what would it be? Um, lamb roast. Number 29, did you have a choice? No. Team you barracked for as a kid? Uh, the Woodville West Torrens, the SNFL Eagles, which is always a, a testy thing when I come over here to, to, to Perth, uh, and the Adelaide Crows. Coffee of choice? Long macchiato. Um, most used emoji? You know, um, probably either the, the guns, like the... Yeah. The fist or whore. um, sort of the one that's got that smiley, like, you know, so look sideways. So I, I don't know what you call that one. We'll uh, find it. We'll show it. The it's gun here. one. Somewhere. The gun one. Is it a generic yellow or do you put a bit of a tan on no, it? i put the tan on yeah. it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, got it. Got it. <laughs> First car. Subaru Leone. Now. Current, current drive. Kia Sorento. That's cute. Uh, where did you sit in team meetings? Uh, so second row. And you're in the row, mm. uh, three from the left. Next to who mostly? Uh, or Tendo Mazunga to, to finish. Uh, who was to my uh, Jack Hanneth? Jack Hanneth to yeah. my and you were on the right. Yeah, not much shoulder room there. <laughs> there wasn't. No. <laughs> Did you ever play an AFL game in the long sleeves? Yes, one. Two thousand and four, round twenty odd, uh, Geelong, freezing cold. One of the like, on the. Yeah, on record, sort of one of the coldest days in Victoria. It was three degrees, pouring with rain. Um, so half time, come in, and rather than having a shower to look pristine, <laughs> uh, having a hot shower and dipping your hands in hot water. Come, that, that bad. It was. Geez. It was <laughs> absolutely. So no, no Powerade, no gout. It was like, give me a cup of tea or a coffee because I'm freezing. <laughs> it was. It, it got smashed as well. It wasn't much fun. I think it was that game that um, Jeff Boyle had the radiator vest um, yep. developed for us, which was just yeah a vest like a wetsuit, but thick, whole body temperature. You, you Jeff Farmer there, hypothermia, like legitimately yeah. <laughs> hypothermia. Aaron Sandiland <laughs> sat on the bench for basically the entire game. Uh, for some reason, we had two rucks that game and he didn't get a look in the big spot. Troy Simmons would have been the other? Yeah, yeah. Simo. Spot. Yeah, nice. 
we touched on the Olympics that have been going on and you did mention that through your uh, adventures with Reedy back in the, in the younger days. You've played a lot of sports. Is there any Olympic sport that you think you would excel in? Greco-Roman wrestling. <laughs> be cool. What, what weight class? <laughs> <laughs> There's some big boys. 100, 100 kilo big, big boys, these yeah. days. Um, well, I think look at my legs and look at my ass. I think I'd be, yeah, that'd be sort of my go. Um, I did, the, we went out for dinner last week. We did that around the table. What would you be most likely, like, what's the most likely chance you've got to represent Australia in and what would you love to, to, mm. to do it in? I, I, the one I'd love to do is the 400. Like I reckon, so the 100, everyone wants the 100, but pretty like the 400 to be 400 meter runner. I think I just go, I think back to Michael Johnson, like Olympics 2000, that, that would be my want to, um, most likely yeah, Greco Roman wrestling. <laughs> Greco -Roman. Big, big you guys, you, what do you, what do you be Dave? Archery. Oh, what would I Archery. be? Archery. Yeah. I don't know. Just 10 minute pistol or something. Yeah. <laughs> oh, just Griff? A, You'd be a, a, a sprinter? Sprinter? Beast, mate. Yeah. No, just, decathlon. Decathlon. Yeah. Just, ah. Jack, Jack of all trades, master of none. Just get through it. Get, 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 get a few points. <laughs> Modern pentathlon, like sort of, uh, that's a bit like, you know, because not the quickest, not the strongest. Just accurate. the most cunning. It'd be, yeah. it'd be, it'd be, it'd be all you, Dave. So um, it was retro round. Couple of weeks ago, did you? We boys would have both would have done the famous no. Rangers. No, you didn't. I didn't. No, not the green. That was no, early, never. early days. That right? was before. Yeah, believe just, it or not, Griff, before me. my time. Just me. Just me. I was new to it then. It's great. But we, I've, I mean, I saw somewhere on social media someone had all your jumpers or mm. you know the variety. I saw that as well. Yeah, That's like about spooky. fifty of them, whatever it was. Yeah, um, yeah you, you're playing a lot over your career. Um, mm. Where do you keep them? Have you kept them? Where are they? Yeah, I've got a couple of co hang hangers. Well, we normally get a couple at the end of the year. Um, but yeah, I've got heaps in my closet at home. Have you got a, like a, um, a man shed or like a little shrine to David somewhere no, at home? No, they just think get tucked in the corner. Yeah. yeah just for, um, uh, posterity and tell my kids how good I was in 20 years when they're old enough. Wouldn't mind. The <laughs> retros ones would be nice to keep. I reckon yeah. they're, they're pretty cool. Yeah. Some reckon. of the indigenous jumpers I've got, um, the little wine cellar. So I've got a couple of jumpers there of the, the indigenous one. Cause I, I that they're, they're so good the way mm. that, um, and, and particularly the connection that the club has had to indigenous heritage mm. and Aboriginal players and how our guys have helped design them. I just love, love those Guernseys. Um, but yeah, there's would been they, a few interesting ones. Yeah. Would they be your favorite if you put you on the spot, but if you had to go and choose one that you could wear for your all. Yeah. And the, the original Fremantle heritage jumper that we yeah. wore back in, I'm not sure if you played in this one, but 2003 and I reckon Oh four we had, um, it's the chevrons, the the three, it might have been the four Vs, I think, but it was red with white and black shorts. Yeah, right. And uh, so it's the original 1890s or whatever it was, Fremantle yeah. Guernsey. Yeah, um, yeah I, and I love the heritage round or the, the retro rounds. I reckon they're awesome. Yeah. Bring um, them back. Well, we saw another one of your ex-teammates, our current gym of footy, Peter Bell, rocking the green, uh, the woolen with the collar, <laughs> jogging across South Fremantle over, I think it was. Uh, I, reckon, I reckon they're great. It that's was, a lovely was, photo. A lot of, co copped a bit of flack for it, I reckon. I think, was I think bringing him back for um, a, a round each year is great. Yeah. Like, it's a, it's a great recognition of, of the past. Uh, the fans get in, in, in behind it. They love it. Fans um, love it. And they do look good. Oh. Yeah. Speaking of looking good, uh, we do have a, a attached photo on the on the back of here. Uh, the strapping of the schnoz of, of both both of you blokes. Who who wore the strapping better? Have a have a look for all the yeah all for the viewers at home if they're yeah. watching. Yeah, um, well, yeah, my nose often got in the way. Uh, when was this? That that's. Do you know what you know? Um, I'm not sure, but it was the last game of the year against Collingwood. Ah, 2008. Yeah, yeah, I remember yeah. that. I remember that uh, that game. Um, what, do you remember the knock? Mine, I reckon that was Ballers. So <laughs> Ballers, that was friendly <laughs> fire. Probably fair. We're yeah. playing Brisbane on a wet, cold Saturday and night. And you didn't give him the first give. Eight. <laughs> 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 no, n normally I'd be going after him. Yeah. Um, I think I'd sort of been for Mark. We just both went for the ball. I just copped a stray elbow. But uh, yeah, thanks, Ballers. Yeah. <laughs> um, maybe another thing that you've probably seen from a different view, as you mentioned, uh, through the media. Is there anything that you've seen a young up, up and coming list, younger kind of squad. Anyone that you really like the look of the young young cores probably the ones that stands out for me. Like uh, Barry, you would have you played a lot alongside them. The Brayshaws and Sarongs, Cheras. Yeah. Is, is that something that you kind of look at now and say, "Geez, they're going all right." Yeah. Um, no, I think there's, and I don't just say this, but I, you can see that that young group are coming through together. Um, yeah, even how long have you been in the system now? Is this your Feels a long time, mate. Feels like, feels like 25, I think. Five, five. years. Five yeah, years. so 
even back to you know whether it's yourself and that young cohort of um, you know, as in inexperienced Luke Ryan and Brennan Cox, sort of that that group down back, uh, the young brigade in the midfield led by Sean and, and Andy and uh, Caleb and Adam, you can really start to see that group gelling together and it, to think that. Um, you haven't really spent a huge amount of time together um, and the COVID situation last year. I think the club's in in a really good spot um, with the way uh, that young group can come together. I think there's been a real connection to the past, which is which is a strength, um, a, a recognition of where you want to go in the future. And I think there's a there's a real strong core there. Uh, and maybe that's why this guy alongside us is going around for, for year 19 because you can see Amen. the light at the end of the tunnel. It's been a pretty lean six years since I've been out of the, or five years since I, I've been out of the, the game for the club, but uh, I think most of the fans and, and everyone can see in the industry that uh, the club's building in the right direction. And it's a huge clash this weekend. We're into the RAC Derby. We've played <coughs> plenty of those amongst us. Um, and it's always a big week for the state, for the teams. In, in particular, this year, we uh, had our first derby this year which with, with no crowd. We mm -hmm. spoke about before how weird that was. And, and this being our home crowd, we really want to um, pack it out. So Definitely. we encourage our fans and members and um, anyone else who's willing to come and put purple on and support us to get, go and buy a ticket and um, let's really pack out up the stadium. How many um, RGs have, have you won the, the uh, derby ones? And BAs? Uh, only one. Just the one. Just Ross probably probably and so you might have won medal. You might have more games, but <laughs> three. Three over here. <laughs> Googled just before, so I just <laughs> make sure I didn't get it wrong. But uh, yeah, definitely. So um, yeah, it should be a good game. Looking forward to it. You can, you'll be boundary boundary side. Um, still yet to un understand when the fixture is at this point in time. Is it a Saturday night or a Sunday? Can um, you tell me? Oh, Do you know? Sure. No, know. we're not sure yet. <laughs> <We're>, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> this has been our eighteen months. Yeah. Just figure you it and out I as both. we go. So um, we're yeah, that, we yeah. share that. Could, could be Monday for a week. It now, would be great. Be it, um, so was it you know, 30 odd on the weekend um, for both teams, I think, plus or minus um, the games last week. It would be great to see 60. Like mm. I, I don't know what the government restrictions are or, or if there no, is any. Yeah. Um, yep. But let's pack it out. Like Both teams with a chance to get inside the eight. Both teams mm. at a time where there's younger players in, a couple of older players out, um, 60,000, mm. uh, and filled largely with Fremantle people. That would be a, a sight. A sight to see. Cheers. Um, that's probably all we've got time for today, anyway. So again, mate, thank you so much for coming in. Um, yeah, it's, it means means a lot to us. I'm sure it's going to mean a lot to the listeners listening for you to spend your time here. So until then, uh, that's enough for old bull young buck. Like and subscribe. Cheers. Cheers. Thank Thanks you. Thank you.